In the vast expanse of the desert, where the winds whisper ancient tales and the sands hold secrets untold, a lone traveler embarks on a pilgrimage through time. Guided by the whispers of the past, they tread lightly upon the earth, tracing the footsteps of those who came before. In the soft glow of dawn's embrace, the desert awakens, revealing the hidden splendors of Petra, a city carved from the living rock, a testament to the ingenuity and resilience of a forgotten kingdom. Behold, the jewel of the desert, Petra, where the echoes of a once mighty kingdom still reverberate through the canyons and caverns, a symphony of whispers carried on the winds of antiquity. The story of the Nabataeans begins amidst the harsh and unforgiving terrain of Arabia. Nomadic tribes roam these lands, eking out a living amidst the arid expanse. But amidst the challenges of desert life, the Nabataeans found opportunity. The Nabataean kingdom controlled many of the trade routes of the region, amassing large wealth and drawing the envy of its neighbors. It stretched south along the Tehama into the Hejaz, up as far north as Damascus, which it controlled for a short period, 85 to 71 BC. Blessed with a strategic location at the crossroads of major trade routes, the Nabataeans seized upon the opportunity to become the masters of commerce. Their caravans traversed the vast deserts, laden with precious goods from distant lands. From the sands of Arabia to the banks of the Nile, the Nabataeans forged alliances and established lucrative trade networks. Their reputation as shrewd merchants and skilled negotiators spread far and wide, attracting traders from all corners of the known world. The Nabataeans were one among several nomadic Bedouin Arab tribes that roamed the Arabian desert and moved with their herds to wherever they could find pasture and water. They became familiar with their area as seasons passed, and they struggled to survive during bad years when seasonal rainfall diminished. The precise origin of the specific tribe of Arab nomads remains uncertain. One hypothesis locates their original homeland in today's Yemen, in the southwest of the Arabian Peninsula, but their deities, language and script share nothing with those of southern Arabia. Another hypothesis argues that they came from the eastern coast of the peninsula. Similarities between late Nabataean Arabic dialect and the ones found in Mesopotamia during the Neo-Assyrian period, as well as a group with the name of Nabatu being listed by the Assyrians as one of several rebellious Arab tribes in the region, suggests a connection between the two. The Nabataeans might have originated from there and migrated west between the 6th and 4th centuries BC into northwestern Arabia and much of what is now modern-day Jordan. Nabataeans have been falsely associated with other groups of people. A people called the Thnabati, who were defeated by the Assyrian king Ashurbanipal, were associated by some with the Nabataeans because of the temptation to link their similar names. Another misconception is their identification with the Nebaioth of the Hebrew Bible, the descendants of Ishmael, Abraham's son. Unlike the rest of the Arabian tribes, the Nabataeans later emerged as vital players in the region during their times of prosperity. However, their influence then faded, and the Nabataeans were forgotten. The literate Nabataeans left no lengthy historical texts. However, thousands of inscriptions have been found in their settlements, including graffiti and on minted coins. The Nabataeans appear in historical records from the 4th century BC although there seems to be evidence of their existence before that time. Aramaic Ostraca finds indicate that the Achaemenid province Idumea must have been established before 363 BC. After the failed revolt of Haker of Egypt and Evagra's Eye of Salamis against the Persians. The Kedarites joined the failed revolt, and consequently lost significant territory and their privileged position in the frankincense trade, and were presumably replaced by the Nabataeans. 
It has been argued that the Persians lost interest in the former territory of the Edomite kingdom after 400 BC, allowing the Nabataeans to gain prominence in that area. All of these changes would have allowed Nabataeans to control the frankincense trade from Dedan to Gaza. The first historical reference to the Nabataeans is by Greek historian Diodorus Siculus who lived around 30 BC. Diodorus refers accounts made 300 years earlier by Hieronymus of Cardia, one of Alexander the Great's generals, who had a first-hand encounter with the Nabataeans. Diodorus relates how the Nabataeans survived in a waterless desert and managed to defeat their enemies by hiding in the desert until the latter surrendered for lack of water. The Nabataeans dug cisterns that were covered and marked by signs known only to themselves. Diodorus wrote about how they were exceptionally fond of freedom, and includes an account about unsuccessful raids that were initiated by Greek general Antigonus I in 312 BC. After Alexander the Great's death in 323 BC, his empire split among his generals. During the conflict between Alexander's generals, Antigonus I conquered the Levant, and this brought him to the borders of Edom, just north of Petra. According to Diodorus Siculus, Antigonus sought to add, the land of the Arabs who are called Nabataeans, to his existing territories of Syria and Phoenicia. The Nabataeans were distinguished from the other Arab tribes by wealth. The Nabataeans generated revenues from the trade caravans that transported frankincense, myrrh and other spices from Udaiman in today's Yemen, across the Arabian Peninsula, passing through Petra and ending up in the port of Gaza for shipment to European markets. Petra, the city of splendor, emerges like a mirage from the desert sands. Carved into the vibrant red rock, its grandeur mesmerizes all who behold it. As the sun casts its golden rays upon the sandstone cliffs, the ancient city comes alive, whispering tales of a bygone era. At the heart of Petra stands the treasury, an architectural marvel that serves as the gateway to this ancient metropolis. Carved with precision into the sandstone cliffs, its facade sparkles in the sunlight, hinting at the wealth and opulence of the Nabataean kingdom. Perched high above the city, the monastery stands as a testament to the Nabataeans' engineering prowess. Its towering façade, adorned with intricate reliefs, commands respect and admiration. As visitors ascend the steep path to its summit, they are greeted by panoramic views of Petra's majestic landscape. Beneath the towering cliffs of Petra lies a vibrant cityscape, bustling with life and commerce. Markets thronged with traders from distant lands, while merchants peddle their wares along narrow alleyways. This was a place where cultures converged, where goods from across the ancient world exchanged hands. From the first light of dawn to the fading glow of sunset, Petra's beauty knows no bounds. Its rose-red cliffs shimmer in the morning light, casting long shadows across the ancient city. As night falls, the stars twinkle overhead, illuminating the pathways of this timeless metropolis. As their wealth and influence grew, the Nabataeans sought a permanent settlement to serve as the beating heart of their kingdom. And thus, Petra rose from the desert sands, a testament to their ambition and ingenuity. Carved into the rose-red cliffs of Jordan, Petra stood as a symbol of Nabataean power and prosperity. Its towering monuments and intricate facades spoke volumes of the wealth amassed through centuries of trade and commerce. From humble beginnings amidst the desolation of the desert, the Nabataean kingdom rose to become a beacon of civilization and commerce. The Nabataean Arabs did not emerge as a political power suddenly, their rise instead went through two phases. The first phase was in the 4th century BC, 
ruled then by an elders' council, which was marked by the growth of Nabataean control over trade routes and various tribes and towns. Their presence in Transjordan by the end of the 4th century BC is guaranteed by Antigonus's operations in the region, and despite recent suggestions that there is no evidence of Nabataean occupation of the Horan in the early period, the Xenon papyri firmly attest the penetration of the Horan by the Nabataeans in the mid-3rd century BC beyond all doubt, and according to Bowersock, it establish. Yes, these Arabs in one of the principal areas of subsequent splendor. Simultaneously, the Nabataeans had probably moved across the Araba to the west into the desert tracks of the Nejef. In their early history, before establishing urban centers, the Nabataeans demonstrated on several occasions their impressive and well-organized military prowess by successfully defending their territory against larger powers. The second phase saw the creation of the Nabataean political state in the mid-3rd century BC. Kingship is regarded as a characteristic of a state and urban society. The Nabataean institution of kingship came about as a result of multiple factors, such as the indispensabilities of trade organization and war, the subsequent outcomes of the Greek expeditions on the Nabataeans played a role in the political centralization of the Nabata tribe. The earliest evidence of Nabataean kingship comes from a Nabataean inscription in the Horan region, probably Basra, which mentions a Nabataean king whose name was lost, dated by Strachey to the early 3rd century BC. The dating is significant, since the available evidence does not attest the existence of Nabataean monarchy until the 2nd century BC. This nameless Nabataean king perhaps could be linked with a reference from the Xenon archive to deliveries of grain to Rabel's men, Rabel being a characteristically royal Nabataean name, it is thus possible to link Rabel of the Xenon archive with the nameless king of Basra's inscription, though it is highly speculative. The testimony of the 4th and 3rd century external accounts and local materialistic evidence demonstrate that the Nabataeans played a relatively substantial political and economic role in the sphere of the early Hellenistic world. While the Nabataeans didn't attain observable characteristics of a Hellenistic state in their early period, similar to contemporary Seleucid Syria, the Milan Papyrus speaks of their wealth and prestige in this period. In that respect, the Nabataeans must be considered a unique entity. Around the same time, the Arab Nabataeans and the neighboring Jewish Maccabees had maintained a friendly relationship, the former had sympathized with the Maccabees, who were being mistreated by the Seleucids. The Romano-Jewish historian Josephus report that Judas Maccabeus and his brother Jonathan marched three days into the wilderness before encountering the Nabataeans in the Horan, where they were settled in for at least a century. The Nabataeans treated them peacefully and told them of what happened to the Jews residing in the land of Galad. This peaceful meeting between the Nabataeans and two brothers in the first book of Maccabees seems to contradict a parallel account from the second book where a pastoral Arab tribe launched a surprise attack on the two brothers. Despite open contradiction between the two accounts, scholars tend to identify the plundering Arab tribe of the second book with the Nabataeans in the first book. They were evidently not Nabataeans, for good relations between the Maccabees and their friends, the Nabataeans, continued to exist. The friendly relations between them is further emphasized by Jonathan's decision to send his brother John to lodge his baggage with the Nabataeans until the battle with the Seleucids is over. Again, the Maccabean caravan suffered an attack by a murderer Arab tribe in the vicinity of Madaba. This tribe was clearly not Nabataean, for they were identified as the sons of Amrai. In Bowersock view, the interpretation of the evidence in the books of Maccabees illustrates the danger of assuming that any reference to Arabs in areas known to have been settled by the Nabataeans must automatically refer to them. 
But the picture is different, many Arab tribes in the region continued to be nomadic and moved in and out of the emerging Nabataean kingdom, and the Nabataeans, as well as invading armies and eventually the Romans also, had to cope with these people. The Nabataeans were allies of the Maccabees during their struggles against the Seleucid monarchs. They then became rivals of their successors, the Judean Hasmonean dynasty, and a chief element in the disorders which invited Pompey's intervention in Judea. The port of Gaza was the last stop for spices that were carried by trade caravans before shipment to European markets, giving the Nabataeans considerable influence over the Gazans. The Hasmonean king Alexander Janius besieged the city of Gaza around 100 BC on the grounds that the Gazans had favored the Ptolemies over the Judeans in their recent battles. Gaza was occupied and its inhabitants put to the sword by Janius. The Hasmoneans, under Janius, launched a campaign that captured several territories in Transjordan north of Nabataea, along the road to Damascus, including northern Moab and Gilead. The territorial acquisitions threatened Nabataean trade interests, both to Gaza and to the Seleucids in Damascus. The Nabataean king, Obodazai fought to restore the areas. Obodas managed to defeat Janius in the Battle of Gadara around 93 BC, when he ambushed him and his forces in a steep valley where Janius was lucky to escape alive. After the Nabataean victory over the Judeans, the former were now at odds with the Seleucids, who were not impressed with the increasing influence of the Nabataeans to the south of their territories. The Nabataeans were again victorious over the Greeks, and this time over the Seleucids. During the Battle of Cana, the Seleucid king Antiochus XII waged war against the Nabataeans, the king himself was slain during combat. His demoralized army fled and perished in the desert from starvation. After Obodas's victories over the Judeans and the Greeks, he became the first Nabataean king to be worshipped as a god by his people. The Nabataean kingdom saw itself slowly surrounded by the expanding Roman Empire, which conquered Egypt and annexed Hasmonean Judea. While the Nabataean kingdom managed to preserve its formal independence, it became a client kingdom under the influence of Rome. The legacy of the Nabataeans extends far beyond the walls of Petra. Their mastery of trade and diplomacy left a lasting impact on the ancient world. From Hegra in Saudi Arabia to Avdat in Israel, Nabataean settlements dotted the landscape, serving as hubs of commerce and centers of cultural exchange. In Hegra, also known as Mada in Sala, the Nabataeans left behind a treasure trove of tombs and monuments carved into the rocky landscape. These structures, adorned with intricate reliefs and inscriptions, stand as silent witnesses to the wealth and sophistication of Nabataean society. Further north, in Avdat, the Nabataeans established a thriving caravan city along the ancient incense route. Here, they built impressive fortifications, cisterns, and dwellings, showcasing their expertise in desert living and water management. But the Nabataean legacy extends beyond architecture and infrastructure. Their influence can be seen in the cultural and religious practices of the region. The Nabataeans worshipped a pantheon of deities, including the god Dushra, whose sanctuary at Petra was a center of pilgrimage and devotion. Moreover, the Nabataeans played a crucial role in facilitating trade and communication between the East and the West. Their control over lucrative trade routes enabled the exchange of goods, ideas, and cultures, contributing to the cosmopolitan nature of the ancient Near East. Though the Nabataean kingdom eventually succumbed to the expansion of the Roman Empire, its legacy lives on in the sands of time. Today, the ruins of Petra and other Nabataean sites stand as reminders of a bygone era, inspiring awe and admiration for the ingenuity and resilience of the Nabataean people. The glory days of the Nabataean kingdom eventually gave way to a period of decline marked by internal strife and external pressures. As rival factions vied for control, the unity that had once characterized Nabataean society began to unravel. 
At the same time, the expanding reach of the Roman Empire posed a significant threat to Nabataean autonomy. In 106 CE, the Nabataean Kingdom fell under Roman rule, becoming the province of Arabia Patria. Despite attempts to maintain their cultural identity, the Nabataeans were gradually assimilated into the broader Roman Empire. Yet, the legacy of the Nabataeans endured long after the fall of their kingdom. The architectural marvels of Petra continued to captivate travelers and scholars alike, serving as a testament to the ingenuity and skill of its creators. Even as their political influence waned, the Nabataeans left an indelible mark on the history and culture of the ancient Near East. Their legacy lives on in the traditions and customs of the modern-day inhabitants of the region, as well as in the ongoing efforts of archaeologists and historians to unravel the mysteries of their civilization. Though the sands of time may obscure their memory, the echoes of Petra serve as a reminder of the remarkable achievements of this ancient people. Their story, like the rock-hewn city they built, will endure for generations to come. In the silence of these majestic ruins, let us reflect on the beauty and resilience of a civilization lost to time. In the fading light of day, the shadows dance upon the weathered stones, casting fleeting glimpses into a bygone era. Like whispers carried by the wind, the echoes of Petra beckon us to ponder the mysteries of history, to seek solace in the enigma of time. Let us embrace the silence of this ancient city, for within its walls lie the secrets of generations past, waiting to be discovered by those who dare to listen.